of climate science and adaptation options by translating complex climate projections into accessible formats. This information helps utility owners and operators better prepare their systems for the impacts of climate change. The speakers for today's NOAA's webinar series includes Kurt Baranowski, Laura Dubin, Jordan Page, and Mike Mayer. Mike Mayer recently earned a Master's of Science in Energy and Policy and Climate from John Hopkins University and is now an ORI's participant working on the Climate Ready Water Utilities Initiative within the EPA's Office of Water. Lauren Dubin is in her fourth and final year as an ORI's fellow with EPA's Climate Ready Water Utilities Initiative. She has a dual master's in international affairs and natural resources and sustainable development from American University and the United Nations University for Peace in Costa Rica. Jordan Page recently earned a Master of Arts in Environmental Studies from Duke University and is completing his ORI's fellowship this May with EPA's Climate Ready Water Utilities Initiative. Kurt Baranowski is an Environmental Protection Specialist with EPA's Water Security Division and is in the team lead for the Climate Ready Water Utilities. He has been at EPA for 16 years. So before we get started, I just had one disclaimer with regards to audio. Um, we're using GoToWebinar's audio feature, and by default, everyone enters the webinar in listen-only mode. Uh, we believe the most efficient way of fielding questions is for you to simply type in the question box um, your question, and then during the last 15 minutes, Nancy and I will read out the questions to the presenters. And um, without further ado, uh, Laura and the EPA team, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Nancy and Amrit, um, and thank you to everybody for joining us this afternoon. So as Amrit mentioned, my name is Laura Dubin, and I work with EPA's Water Security Division on the Climate Ready Water Utilities Initiative, or CREW. Next slide, please. So today we're going to talk about um, the history behind CREW and our suite of tools and resources that we offer to the water utility sector, and then we'll conclude with some of our pilot and outreach activities. Next slide, please. Um, so I know we just covered some housekeeping items, but if you have any questions um, throughout our presentation, just type them into the chat box, and uh, we'll see if we can take them as we go along and at the end. So next slide. All right. <clears throat> so for some crew history, in 2010, the National Drinking Water Advisory Council, or NIDWAC, submitted a report to the EPA Administrator recommending the establishment of a crew initiative and the importance of using adaptive management or an iterative process to help utilities adapt to climate change impacts. NIDWAC also outlined an adaptive response framework, which is the basis for all of our tools. Next slide. And based on the NIDWAC Working Group report, um, Climate Ready Water Utilities Initiative was established in EPA's Water Security Division in 2011. For those of you not familiar with CREW, our mission is to provide the water sector with the practical tools and technical assistance needed to adapt to climate change by promoting a clear understanding of climate science and adaptation options. Next slide. We do this in a number of ways, as you can see by this slide. The graphic shows our current crew products and how they help build climate readiness in the water sector. As a suite, these tools and resources are the foundation for providing the assistance many utilities need to begin planning for climate change. And now I'll turn the mic over to my colleague Jordan Page, who will take us through the Adaptation Strategies Guide. So next slide. Hello, good afternoon everyone. I'm Jordan and I'm going to provide you with a brief overview of our Adaptation Strategies Guide resource. So the Strategies Guide is a reference guide and planning tool for water utilities. The guide contains utility and location specific information on climate change impacts and their relevant adaptation options. Uh, next slide please. So the guide is in a clickable PDF uh, format, formatted document. So readers will navigate this document similar to navigating a website. So you'll click links to jump to different sections of the brief. The guide provides a good starting point for utilities, especially for smaller systems, since the climate and adaptation information is provided in an easy to grasp way that can help jumpstart utility discussions. We recently 
updated the guide with sustainability sections, which include water conservation, energy management, and green infrastructure practices. Next slide, please. This image shows the process users can take when going through the guide. It has briefs divided up into three different categories, regional climate impacts, utility challenges, and sustainability strategies. So a user would start by exploring the climate information challenges for their region, and then they click on specific challenges like drought or flooding for a more detailed brief. And finally, they can review relevant adaptation options. Next slide, please. So on this screen, you can see an example of a climate region brief. The first brief is the national brief, followed by briefs for each of the climate regions shown on the map, which are from the U.S. Global Change Research Program. All of our crew products follow the map from the U.S. GCRP, which is the acronym for the Change Research Program, so our regions are consistent across the board. Each climate brief contains a description of the projected changes for that region. There's also an example of climate science that relates specifically to that region. Next slide, please. Here's an example from the challenge briefs. The purpose here is to help translate climate science into utility relevant challenges, showing how climate change could affect the ability of utilities to manage assets or run operations. At the top of each brief is a description of the challenge followed by examples of adaptation options. Next slide, please. The adaptation options are lumped into three broad categories for planning, operations, and maintenance, and those related to capital and infrastructure investments. This approach gives options to utilities with different levels of resource constraints. We also include utility examples here so you can see how they're being implemented. Next slide, please. Here's an example from the sustainability briefs. Currently, we have briefs on green infrastructure, energy management, and water conservation. Next slide, please. All right, thanks, Jordan. Um, so up next, we'll look at some tools that go beyond planning and research and actually help utilities and communities move towards implementing adaptation strategies. So we have the Extreme Weather Events Workshop Planner, which contains the materials needed to plan and conduct a workshop on how extreme events could impact a utility and its watershed. Next slide, please. The workshop planner walks users through the process of developing a customized workshop to discuss the impacts of extreme events and how a utility or community can adapt to them, as well as identifying actionable next steps so participants can begin to build resilience in the long term. The tool provides literally everything you need to plan and conduct the workshop, including invitations, lists of relevant stakeholders to invite, agendas, facilitator guides, discussion topics, and even PowerPoint presentation. Next slide. And within the workshop planner, we include five extreme event scenarios, and they are flooding, drought, sea level rise, wildfire, and reduced snowpack. So for each of these scenarios, you can view PowerPoints and explanations on how they can impact a utility and a watershed. Next slide, please. We've conducted several pilots using the tool and its process. In Bisbee, Arizona, we worked with the Rural Community Assistance Program, or RCAP, to help plan the workshop there. And it was a great success story because the town brought together a variety of different stakeholders who had not previously worked together despite the interconnectedness of their jobs and sectors, including first responders, hospitals, morgues, the forest service, et cetera. And throughout this workshop process, they initiated a new town emergency plan, which came in handy during an extreme flooding event in 2014. And since then, they've had several follow-up meetings um, and are planning more workshops down the road. Right now, we're working with RCAP to update the tool to help streamline the process and make it web-based so folks don't have to download it onto their desktops. And now I'll turn the mic over to my colleague, Mike Mayer, um, to talk about some of our mapping tools. So next slide, please. <clears throat> Thanks, Laura. So on this slide, uh, you can see a screenshot of our tool, which is called the Scenario-Based Projected Changes Map. Um, this is available on our EPA website at epa.gov uh, slash climate-ready-utilities. Um, and the intent of this map is to provide users easy access to scenarios of projected climate changes for their particular location of interest. So a, a user can zoom in on their location or type the location into the search field to the right of the map toolbar, and 
when they do that, they'll find changes uh, in their annual total precipitation, their annual average temperature, their precipitation intensity for the 100-year storm, and also sea level rise. Next slide, please. Uh, in this screenshot, this, the user has zoomed in on a grid cell in the New York area. And so when a grid cell is chosen, a data table pops up that provides uh, three climate change scenarios with model projections in two time periods, which are 2035 and 2060. And the, the three scenarios are hotter and drier conditions, central conditions, which represent the middle of the distribution across models, and warmer and wetter conditions. And these are the same scenarios and the same data that is used by the CREATE software uh, which will be uh, discussed uh, further along in the presentation. Um, the data in, these tab in the table is also provided uh, as positive values for increases and negative values for decreases relative to a baseline of observed climate at this location from 1970 to 2000. And each scenario uh, includes projected changes in temperature and precip averaged over two 30-year time periods. The 2035 period is uh, from 2021 to 2050, and the 2060, 2060 period is from 2046 to 2075. And the range of potential sea level rise by 2060 is also provided for the coastal grid cells, which you see outlined in blue. So to summarize, this map gives users a quick snapshot of the potential climate scenarios for their location. And this is a great starting place for when a water utility, or anyone for that matter, because this is available publicly on our website, wants to start thinking about planning for the future climate. Next slide, please. This is another web uh, map-based tool on our site, um, which is called the Storm Surge Inundation and Hurricane Frequency Map. And this map illustrates current worst-case coastal storm surge or inundation scenarios, and also hurricane strike frequency, um, which is derived from three different data sources. First is the sea lake and overland surge from hurricane models, or slosh, uh, from NOAA. Uh, second is the 100 and 500 year floodplains from FEMA. And third is the hurricane strike data set from the National Hurricane Center. So in this map, the user can zoom in on the location or type the location again in the search field. And they can uh, also check the boxes to the right of the screen, which you see there, to toggle on the different uh, slosh, FEMA, and hurricane data layers on and off. And so for ease of use, the layers will automatically disappear depending on the zoom level. But in this expanded view, we can see the hurricane strike frequency layer. The coastal counties you see are color indexed based on the hurricane returning period calculated from all hurricane categories that occurred from 1900 to 2009. The counties you see in red are those which have experienced a hurricane period of less than 10 years. Uh, those in orange have experienced a return period of 10 to 30 years and so on uh, for the blue, black, and gray counties uh, remaining. And so when a user clicks on a county, a pop-up table displays the number of strikes and the return period for each hurricane category. Next slide, please. So on this slide, the, zoomer, the user zoomed in and clicked on Houston, Texas. And you can see the pop-up window displaying the number and category level of hurricanes that have hit Houston from 1900 to 2009. And the return period column in the table is the average recurrence interval of a hurricane of similar magnitude over an extended period of time. And this is all historical data. It's not meant to project what future conditions might look like, but it's a good place uh, to start planning from. Next slide. Here's the same map of Houston, but I've turned off the hurricane layer and turned on the 100 and 500 year FEMA flood map layers. And the 100 flood map 100-year flood map uh, displays those hazard areas that are subjected to inundation by a flood that has a 1% or greater chance of being equaled or exceeded during any given year, which is commonly referred to as the 100-year flood or the base flood. And the 500-year flood map is the same idea, except it's a 0.2% chance or greater of being equaled or exceeded during a, any given year. And these maps are used by the National Flood Insurance Program as the basis for insurance requirements. On this map of Houston, you can see where the 100 and 500 year flood maps overlap each other, uh, indicated by the dark blue shading. The lighter blue shading represents the 500 year uh, flood inundation zone. So by zooming into greater detail than I did for this screenshot, you can see um, if your specific location is located within a floodplain. Next slide. 
here's Houston again, but I've turned off the other layers and turned on the Category 4 slosh layer because Houston has not had a Category 5 hurricane. So I removed the legend to make it easier to see the map, but if you had displayed it, it would show that the red area represents an inundation level of greater than 9 feet above ground. The orange area is greater than 6 feet the yellow greater than three, and then the blue is up to three feet of inundation. And this is a high level view so you can get a sense of the tool, but the, zoomer, the user could zoom in to get more accurate information about a specific location. So to provide a little bit more detail about SLOSH, um, SLOSH is a numerical model used by the National Weather Service to compute storm surge, which is defined as the abnormal rise of water generated by a storm over and above the predicted astronomical tides. And the flooding depends on many factors such as the track intensity size and forward speed of the hurricane as well as characteristics of the coastline where it comes ashore or passes nearby. So the slosh map you see here was created by computing the maximum storm surge resulting from roughly 10,000 to 60,000 hypothetical storms um, each simulated through a slosh grid of varying forward speed, radius of max wind, intensity, categories one through five, uh, landfall location, initial water level, and storm direction. And so the shaded area represents the maximum of the maximum surge inundation from combining all of those hypothetical, hypothetical storms. So that all of that is to say that this depicts a worst case scenario for a given category of storm and initial water level under ideal storm conditions. Here a high tide uh, initial water level is used in the analysis. So for we think for this map, um, the hurricane, the FEMA flat, FEMA flood maps and the slosh data all, all combined into one map make this a great uh, starting place uh, for planning purposes. And at this point, I will take a minute to see if there are any questions over the chat box. Looks like there are not. And then I'll turn the mic over to Kurt Baranowski and start talking about our uh, risk assessment software known as CREATE. Great. Thanks, Mike. And I would just add to um, the information that Mike provided just so Folks, whether you're within NOAA or certainly outside of NOAA, um, the data that you see in front of you as it relates to SLOSH was generated by NOAA's National Hurricane Center. And that data has been released on NOAA's website as well as EPA's website, and it's the same exact data. So I just don't want folks to be confused that EPA might be developing a separate set of data. This all works off of the same geo platform, so folks see the same exact information. So certainly the expertise on SLOSH re, uh, resides within NOAA and at National, at NOAA's National Hurricane Center. So I just wanted folks to understand that before we moved into CREATE. So if we can move on to the next slide, I'll talk about our oh, climate Kurt? resilience. Yes. Kurt, hi, this is Nancy. We do have a couple questions, and I think they're relevant to right now. Do you, do you guys want to take them now? Yeah, later? absolutely. Let's do it. Okay, so we have one question that says, I'm sorry, but what GCMs are being used? They can vary greatly from temperature deltas of 1 to 8 degrees centigrade. I'll answer that. So um, you're in particular, you're talking about the global uh, circulation models as it relates to the projection page that Mike had talked about earlier. And in there, we actually use an average of, I think it's 16 different global uh, or uh, GCMs across the board. Um, if you go into create, there's a, I, and I can provide the exact data to folks, but there is um, our methodology on the models that we used, the data that we used, how we selected data that was specific to the, to the United States. Um, so I can't get into great detail because it, it's, a, it's a much larger explanation as to what we did and how we did it, but whoever that person is, Nancy, if you could forward their name to me or I can put a email together with more detail, I can then send it to you and we can send it out to the group. I just don't want to take up too much time trying to explain um, the climate science data that we used in, two, in the 2.0 version of uh, CREATE and what's up on the projection page. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll send that to you, but we have a couple more quick questions if it's okay, and some of them look like they're duplicates. Sure. Um, for, here's, are the GIS layers available for download? Um, right now, it, depend, it depends. Um, they're available 
on the geo platform. So if you're a federal agency, you can work with Net National Hurricane Center to access that data. I know there are issues with sharing it outside of the federal family, but um, again, if, a, if there are a particular group of people that need access to that data, um, Nancy, you can forward their contact information to me and I will get them in touch with the right people at National Hurricane Center. Okay, and, and just in case we get a deluge of people, um, Kurt is in, at EPA and his last name is Baranowski. But we'll take, if there's a couple that come in, we'll definitely take those. Um, I think we have one more one more message, let's see. Uh, oh yeah, okay, it was the same question you just answered. Okay. Hey Nancy, this is Laura. Um, at the end of the presentation, we'll have a slide up with all of our contact info, so if folks want to email us directly, that might be a bit easier. Um, that would be great, just because I was afraid for that particular one, we were going to get a bunch of requests. So, yeah. okay, so wait till the end and you'll get all the emails. Okay, we're, we're going on mute again. Okay. And um, just to add on to that, you'll get all of our contact information at the end, but it's probably best to email me, Kurt Baranowski, and I'll be sure to uh, respond to you as quickly as possible. So moving on to our climate resilience evaluation and awareness tool, and I'm going to refer to that as CREATE. Um, we can move on to the next slide, but before I address those issues on the next slide, I just want folks on the phone to understand that we built this tool um, as a resource for drinking water and wastewater utility owners and operators to better understand what their climate futures might be. Um, we didn't in any way, shape, or form develop this on our own. We worked with um, many stakeholders in the sector, so other federal agencies that have climate science expertise such as NOAA, USGS, Department of Interior, um, Global Change Research Program, EPA's Office of Research and Development, our Office of Air, and then many drinking water and wastewater utility owners and operators. So there are many utilities out there that have been considering climate for a very long time, have been very proactive in their approach. Um, we've had them as part of our working group, so just a few of those so folks might have a better understanding of who's worked with us. Southern Nevada Water Authority that services Las Vegas, um, the Seattle, Ut Seattle Washington Utility, uh, East Bay Municipal Utilities District in Oakland, California. We've worked with Denver, Philadelphia, New York City. So quite a few large utilities that um, are doing their own climate assessments and have worked with us on um, what are three versions of this tool. So 1.0 we released it's about four years ago now, if my memory is not failing me. Um, we released version 2.0, which is the current version of the tool up on EPA's website about two years ago. That's a downloadable piece of software. And we are currently working on version 3.0, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, as I move through my presentation. But um, there are some nice changes that we're making to the tool as well as updating some of the climate science data within the tool, but I think most uh, I don't want to say, most importantly is the wrong term, but one of the great advantages I think to this version of the tool is we're going from what is a desktop downloadable piece of software over to a web-based tool, which will enable quick updates to information, um, quick updates to the tool. So I think it's a, it's a great advancement in um, create as far as usability, user friendliness, and then of course the ability to update. So giving you a little bit of history there, let me tell you about create and what it is. Um, as I said already, it's a software tool right now that's moving over to a web-based tool that helps a utility conduct a risk assessment to better understand its climate futures. We, it's a scenario-based planning tool. So we're not saying to any user, this is your number as it relates to temperature, precipitation, sea level rise, extreme events. What we're doing is we're providing scenarios, and I'll talk about what those scenarios are in a minute. Um, 
when a user has a better understanding of their climate projections and what they are in the future, that helps to then uh, better identify adaptive measures. And then at the end, um, with all of the work that's put into the tool, we actually provide what is a report that the user can then have to um, either continue to update or present to whether it's their chief financial officer or their board of the local elected officials, whatever it might be, to um, figure out how to start to implement the planning process for adaptive measures in the water sector. So if we can move on to the next slide. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide here because I'm going to talk about each one of these steps in detail as I move through my presentation. But this is a nice flow diagram that um, <clears throat> illustrates the process currently in version 2.0 of um, CREATE. Uh, if folks look at the upper right-hand corner of the tool or of this slide, you can see um, in the threats portion of the tool, this is where we provide what our projection data for temperature, sea level rise, where applicable precipitation, and then uh, extreme event storm or intense precipitation. Um, I'll talk more about not only the 2.0 version in the data, but also um, data related to the 3.0 version in, in a little bit. So if we can move on to the next slide. And Nancy, I know that you're on mute, but if there are questions that are popping up that you feel are relevant, um, you know, just please stop. I'm happy to answer them as I move through this, or we can wait to the very end. Either way, it works for me. Um, I just don't want to get too far into this presentation and then um, have folks be confused or not remember their questions or whatever it might be. So the slide that everybody is seeing in front of them now is sort of, okay, well, what can CREATE do for you? Um, as I had mentioned earlier, this is built for people in the water sector, so drinking water and wastewater utilities, but it does follow a standard risk assessment process, and the climate projection data is the climate projection data. Um, many people look at it many different ways. This kind of goes back to the question that I, we received earlier about, well, which models did you use and how did you use them and how were they manipulated? Um, there are many ways to look at that, and certainly there are many um, uncertainties as it relates to climate data, but we can sort of all agree that we're moving into what are warmer atmospheres and what might be either wetter in certain parts of the country or drier in other parts of the country, and certainly we all um, understand that sea level rise is occurring. All we have to do is look at some of the terrible things that are happening to some of our coastal communities out there. and. Um, you can see the evidence of that. Um, my point here is that um, while this tool is built for the water sector, it has application to, I think, any sort of critical infrastructure. And it was one of the reasons specifically why we built the projection webpage that Mike talked about earlier. Um, the, heard back from many of our users and stakeholders that helped us develop the tool that, okay, I don't want to go through a full risk assessment or even download the tool in order to be able to access all this great projection data that's internal to create, so can you just give it to us? And so that's why we built the page that we did, and I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end, about how we're going to update that based on the climate data that's in 3.0. So within CREATE, we help to build awareness for utilities that may not understand their climate impact. We help them better assess the risk, and then, as I had mentioned earlier, plan for what their futures might be. So that's you know, a standard risk assessment approach and how most risk assessment uh, tools do work. So if we can move on to the next slide. This is very similar to the flow diagram that you looked at before. So this is all the steps that were in the flow diagram, but this is an actual screen grab of one of the opening screens within CREATE 2.0. So to the left-hand side of this tool, um, where you see kind of the red outline, 
this is where the user goes in and tells the tool everything about themselves. The setup part is that basic, you know, I'm this type of utility, this is where I'm located, um, this is my service population, things of that nature, some really basic information. And then they get into the threats piece. So the threat data within Create 2.0 is based on the 2010 Global Change Research Program report. And when we release version 3.0, we will actually be updating that data based on the 2014 Global Change Research Program report. And we'll, I, we're going to be identifying the specific RCPs, the global, uh, the GCMs that we're using, and then the data that we're using around sea level rise in a separate document that we're actually going to make into an EPA publication. So. Um, this again goes back to that question that was asked earlier. Um, in version 2.0, you have to go into the tool, download the whole thing, then download the methodology to get to the piece that tells you about how we, what models we used, what we did with them. And that's why I was saying earlier, send me an email and I will kind of cut and paste that section out for you so you don't have to go through that entire process. But instead, with 3.0, I'm hoping that maybe within the next two months before the release of the tool, we'll actually not only publish what is a, a framework for the overarching tool, but then a very specific paper on the climate science data, the data we used, and how we accessed it within the tool. Um, back to the slide. Um, after the utility gets a better understanding of its threats with the data that's provided within the tool. Oh, I'm seeing a, a black screen. I don't know if that's, oh, there we go, good. I'm hoping other folks didn't see that. Um, a user will then go in and identify particular assets that they're concerned about. One of the things that we always say to our user base is, don't go out there and identify every particular asset that you think is gonna be, imp uh, be impacted by climate. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. Think about the asset that you're most concerned about and then start going through your process that way. Um, it's not only an easier way to approach a risk assessment, but it's probably all that is necessary at a lot of utilities to begin with. And it teaches you the process and then it also allows you, because this is a piece of software, it's, easily, it's easy to go back in and update it and um, add to it if you choose to do so. And we have some nice training on 2.0 up on our website, and at the end we'll give you the link to our website, and I think Laura might even be talking about that at the end. So then if you look at the right-hand side of the tool, um, this is where you actually do your physical assessment. So baseline analysis is, okay, where am I today as it relates to climate impact and potentially maybe some adaptation options that I have in place or maybe I don't have any in place. From there, you go into your resilience analysis. You think about the types of adaptation options that you actually want to put into place over the future based on whatever projection years you looked at in the assessment, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And then at the end, what's really nice is you get these sort of planning packages as it relates to dollars and risk reduction, and then ultimately your results. So you can kind of compare, okay, I can implement these types of cost savings or implementation actions, and um, this may cost a lot of money, but it may be worthwhile in the wrong run, long run, or I may not have the money to do it right now, and I have to plan in the future, how do I do that? So I think it's a really nice way to kind of take a look at all your different adaptation options, all your options for implementation, and then start to think about what your potential future might be. So if we could um, move forward to the next slide. I think I probably covered a lot of the information on the upcoming slides and what I just did in that overview of the tool, but um, I'll hit up any pieces that I may miss. So CREATE provides historic data. These are, um, if you look at the bottom right-hand corner, I'm not sure what this is a screen grab of in the sense of which part of the country, but you can, all those little white dots that you see are NOAA weather stations that provide historic data. So you can say here in front of you that there's 30 years worth of data. As it relates to precipitation, 
from NOAA climate stations. Um, and what the user can do is they go into this map, they select the um, weather station that's most applicable to where their vulnerable asset is, and then they get this nice history of data as it relates to precipitation and temperature for um, the assessment. You can also see here that these grid cells that are over the map, they're 32 by 32 miles, um, so it's down to a half degree resolution that we provide within the tool. So for instance, you may have, um, your utility may be in one, um, or your user's utility may be in one grid cell, but you may be concerned about your reservoir that's in the a grid cell, that, grid cell that's, I don't know, 200 miles away if you have that type of utility. So you may be choosing the weather station that's closest to that reservoir 200 miles away in order to conduct your assessment. It just depends on how you're looking at this. Um, for instance, we've been doing a lot of work with uh, East Bay Municipal Utilities District that um, services Oakland, California, which is a very large city right outside of San Francisco. And um, that's exactly what they do. Their, their reservoirs, I think, are uh, 100, 200 miles away from where their actual facility is located. And their assessment is based on weather stations that are by the reservoir and not by the utility. So if we could move forward to the next slide, please. Hi, Kurt. We have one question for you as, as we're changing slides. Sure. Um, in what regions can CREATE be used? Can it be used in Hawaii and the Pacific Islands? Um, yes. So my apologies for not explaining that to folks. Um, CREATE covers the lower 48 states, Alaska, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico. So. Um, for folks that are on the line or the person that had that question, at the end when we provide you the link to our web page and you access the um, projection page, you can see very specifically where we provide all the projection data for um, the entire United States. But that's what we do. We've built this tool as a federal agency here in the United States for use by um, drinking water and wastewater operators that are in the U.S. Um, with that said, I have been having a lot of discussions with the Australians who have a tool called Adapt Water that's very similar to CREATE. There's something similar um, in the United Kingdom that there might be some connect to. So we're talking about how to sort of globally connect these tools, but for folks on the phone and for use of this tool, it's built specific to um, people in the United States. Okay, I have one more question. Sorry. Sure, go ahead. Okay. Um, how does CREATE deal with bias correcting historical data? For example, if the station data is located in an airport, but your watershed is in the mountains, does the historical data capture more localized weather effects, or is the historical data still fairly coarse? Um, so, Nancy, I'm going to answer this question, and if, uh, if you don't think I answered it or if the, um, the uh, asker doesn't think I a answered it, let me know. Uh, maybe if we could take a couple of steps back to the slide that actually had the grid cell and the weather stations on it. So I think it might be two slides back. Or there it is, right there. Oh, just, yeah, thank you. Uh, so hopefully folks are seeing this. So. Like I said, this is a tiny snapshot of a certain section of the United States, but realize that this grid cell is across the entire United States of the lower 48, as well as Alaska, as well as Hawaii and Puerto Rico. And as I was saying earlier, you can select any of these assessment or these uh, weather stations as an assessment point for your physical risk assessment. So. Just because you're located in one area does not mean that you can't choose a weather station and another grid cell to conduct your assessment. So I think, I hope I'm answering that question. The other caveat that I would add to all of this is many utilities have their own weather information. And across the board in version 2.0 of CREATE as well as version 3.0, 
there's tremendous flexibility to add your own information. So if you have your own weather information, you can add it into the tool. If you have your own projection information or if you have projection information related to precipitation, temperature, or sea level rise that um, you've accessed from another source, you can also use that within the tool. Now we provide it for users here, but we're not saying this is the end all. This is one approach towards projection data as it relates to, um, and I'll stop saying this because I think folks get it, but temperature, precipitation, intense storm, and sea level rise, but that doesn't mean that you can't use other data. So does that answer the asker's question, Nancy? Um, I think so. Uh, wait. Oh, the answer, the asker just said yes. Good. Glad. All right. So anything else? Uh, we're good for now. Okay, good. Thank you. So um, I think I talked to, I, ha I have, I've talked about this um, in great detail of what's on the slide here. I've talked about the types of information that Create provides. And I think in the next slide, I'm going to talk about the actual scenario. So if we can move to the next slide. Oh, well, this is actually, I think the next slide actually gets into the scenarios, but this is a, a great slide to, uh, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, go back to, this is a great slide to show prior. So when talking about model projections, you can see here, this is just a nice sort of screen grab of the different models that we looked at. This is not applicable across the board. This is just one area um, of how we've looked at climate projection data within CREATE, the, the particular models that we've used, and how we've kind of connected it. So I think that this graph um, starts to illustrate to folks, it doesn't provide great detail, and that's why I do want to provide that level of detail in an email to folks that ask this question. But in particular, um, if you look at the bottom left-hand side of this slide, you can see that the data came from IPCC um, AR4 projected temperature changes using um, ESRES um, A1B. So for folks that are that into the modeling aspect of things, that probably makes a lot of sense to you, and I'm not trying to downplay anybody's intelligence on this line, but there are a lot of folks that just don't dig down into the level of detail of understanding all these models. but. This is all federally vetted data that we use within CREATE. It's accepted kind of across the board, or not kind of, it's accepted across the board um, by the federal government through GCRP. So this is what we're accessing and using, or this is the type of data we're accessing and using within CREATE um, 2.0, and we'll do the same in 3.0. So if we can move on to the next slide. So with the climate scenarios, um, again, a, I think a nice graphic slide here, but let me explain to folks um, what a user gets within CREATE. So we provide them with three model projections, what we call a hotter and drier model, a central model, and a warmer and wetter model. And it's not to say that any one of these three models um, will occur any more than another. It's just what the models are showing us from sort of the high end to the low end as it relates to climate projections for the data that we used within the tool. We provide users with two time periods to look at. The way that they're actually um, illustrated within the tool is 2035, which is the time period of 2020 to 2050, and then 2060, which is the time period of 2045 to 2075. Now within, so this is, um, what you're seeing here is how the data is presented in the time periods that we use within 2.0. The approach will be extremely similar in 3.0. The only sort of caveat that I would add here is from the time period perspective, um, We'll still be providing these two time periods, but our working group, especially the utility members, were much more concerned about um, being able to almost look at things in 10-year fragments 
Um, sometimes it's hard for folks to think outside of their own life expectancy or their job life expectancy. So the tool will be set up a little bit different in 3.0 where you'll be able to look at, you'll be able to type in any time period you want up to, I think it's 2100, and it'll provide the projection data for the user. The other um, addition or I think what is um, new feature of 3.0 here in, in the sense of time period is you'll be able to also look at what is your current day scenario. So people just wanted to be able to do an assessment as to where they are today to figure out whether or not they even need to move forward. So that will be another um, nice feature that will be built within 3.0 and I don't want to talk too much about that but um, because I would any of you on the phone whether you're interested or want to use um, 2.0, I would encourage you to do so because the transition from 2.0 to 3.0 will be very easy and um, certainly if anybody runs into any problems with that, EPA will provide you with assistance with that. But So if we can move on to the next slide. So I just wanted to kind of show here some of the types of data that the user um, receives as it relates to projection data within the tool. Um, the way that this is illustrated will change probably a little bit in um, 3.0, but not greatly. And so you can kind of see here average temperature, total precipitation, 24-hour storm event, and then of course sea level rise. So this is just a nice graphic way to kind of present this data. So if we can move to the next slide. Um, I'm not going to get into great detail here in the sense of risk assessment, but as um, folks walk through the risk assessment process, what they're doing is they're pairing up their assets with their threats and then conducting a risk assessment based on that asset threat pair. So it's just some basic information. We've kind of talked about this already, so I think we can kind of move on to the next slide. Um, I breezed over this a little bit before in the baseline analysis, which kind of shows you your current resilience, whether or not you have um, adaptation options on um, implemented at your utility, or maybe you just are doing some regular O and M that may actually be some sort of adaptation, which would be, which is fantastic. But um, I think the nice thing here is, and again, this display will change a little bit in 3.0, but you can kind of see. The, different, the two different time periods that are provided all the way to the right-hand side, uh, right side of the screen. And then you can see um, the different types of um, adaptive measures that can actually be put in, put in place based on um, the particular asset that was chosen in these drop-down trees within CREATE, so there's, there are these nice libraries of adaptive measures that utilities can use that can be either bundled up or expanded depending on how of in-depth of an analysis you want to do. So I think this is just more a nice way to kind of understand the types of information that um, CREATE is providing to you. So we can move on to the next slide. Um, this part of the tool here is where you assess consequences. So in 2.0, the approach that we're taking is for the user to kind of come in and provide severity or what we call weights to the five different um, consequence areas. So if you can see the kind of in the middle of the screen, the green blocks, it says utility business impacts equipment damage, uh, water resource impacts, environmental impacts, and community impacts. Those consequence um, bins or categories will remain within 3.0, but the nice thing about 3.0 will be that instead of the user kind of coming in and giving this more qualitative um, approach towards the tool and the weights as it relates to consequence, we're actually going to be providing um, matrices for drinking water and wastewater utilities based on size and dollar amounts because at the end of the day in 3.0, what we're going to wind up doing is with all the resor 
result is quantifying them into dollars. So I'll talk a little bit more about the current outputs within CREATE 2.0, um, but one of the things that we've heard over and over again from our user group is that dollars really resonate with everybody, whether it's the user, whether it is the decision maker on funding the implementation of the adaptation option, or the board of a local, or the board of elected officials that have to make the decision on how to move forward or fund these types of adaptation options. So I think an important sort of um, step forward within the tool and its results um, and something that I think is going to be very useful to folks. Um, as I had mentioned earlier with the climate science data, um, users can easily put their own dollar amounts with